All right, are we ready to start? All right, let's start. So my name is Adrian Otto. I'm here with Steve Dake. Hi, folks. I'm from we, Cisco uh, Systems. I'm from Rackspace. This is the room safe in the hotel room that I'm staying at here in Vancouver. And last night, I had this laptop with my slides on it for this presentation. And I put it in here for safekeeping. And when I came back this morning, about 1 in the morning, to just check a little email before I went, the safe would not open. It wants to say IR on the front. I don't know why it wants to do IR, but it does not want to do open, which is what I want to see, O-P-E-N, on the front. IR is irreplaceable. <laughs> <laughs> so I call down to the front desk, and I'm like, I'm really sorry. You know, I know it's 1 in the morning, but I really need to get into that safe because there's hundreds of people who are going to want to hear my talk in the morning at 9 o'clock, and I can't do it without the slides. So um, they sent up some guys with like this, like, they had like this safe cracking device, and they came out with this thing, and they hooked it up to here, and they couldn't make this IR just would not budge. So they're like, uh, you know, we're really sorry. I'm going to call somebody else and see if they can bring it in. They brought in somebody else. He couldn't do it. They said, well, we have the engineering, t the engineering staff comes in at 7.30 in the morning. We'll have them come up. And you just have a good night's sleep, Adrian. And um, <laughs> we'll see at 7.30. Meanwhile, Adrian calls me at 3 o'clock in the morning and says, can you make backup slides just in case? And I did. They showed up at 7.30, yes. just as they promised. Yes. Yeah, Marriott, these guys, their customer service is excellent. They, uh, they, they tried again. You know, two more guys, two different guys tried to get in the safe. They're like, yeah, your, your controller board that controls the lock will not work. And um, so they took my safe out. They took it down to the workroom. They took out the grinders. And they're grinding on my computer, trying to get, trying to get the safe open so that I could be here. And there are, I have proof there are metal shavings in my magnetic um, <laughs> my, uh, power port. So I could not actually plug in my laptop. So if we run out of battery, we'll just have to switch. do an extemporaneous demo on somebody else's computer. Sounds but good. Uh, here we go. So Magnum is about providing a container service on OpenStack. It's not about inventing a new kind of a container. It's about making the prevailing container technology just work well with OpenStack clouds. That's its, that's its purpose and vision. There's a whole lot of developers working on this right now. And this has seen more interest and velocity than any other open source project um, I have ever observed. It's obvious you guys want to have containers in OpenStack. There is a diverse set of contributors. In fact, in our new governance process in OpenStack, we actually have a tag for projects that's called something like diversity. Something about diversity. It's like mm -hmm. team diversity. Right. And not all the, uh, the projects can have this tag. But what this means is essentially, if any one of the uh, sponsoring entities or to vanish, that you could have confidence that the development of the uh, project would continue. And so we have this tag. We're very proud of that. But we're not the first to provide a containers solution for OpenStack. There's been container support in there for a while. And um, we were able to create libvert. Uh, through libvert, we can create LXC containers. We've been able to do that for a long, long time. We have Nova Docker in there, and there's, uh, since Icehouse, we've had a heat resource in Docker. But the thing that these things don't do is provide a scheduling function, an orchestration function, the ability to control what actually happens for, in the processes that run within the container. Those things are beyond the scope of what the Nova API was designed for. And so heat um, you know, takes it uh, like one step further, but not quite enough. Right, because there's no concept of a of a cluster of uh, hosts running containers, and Magnum fills this gap. So there are some overlaps between what Nova machine, what Nova instances need, and what containers need, but that overlap is really narrow. Um, things like create and delete are obviously overlapping. So if all you need to do is start and stop 
your container and just run a, you know, a pre-baked process inside of it, then something like Livered LXC is per perfectly appropriate as long as all the um, containers on the same host are, are not hostile workloads, meaning um, belonging to different tenants. Um, but Nova and containers, because they have the different lifecycle, because they have the different I API, need a dedicated service that has an API intended only for the exclusive use of containers, and that's what Magnum is. So it's a combination of OpenStack and Kubernetes and Flannel and Docker Swarm. And all of those things combined give us this integrated solution called Magnum. And if you saw the keynote on Tuesday, I displayed for you a, a heat stack that showed all of the things that actually happened in the orchestration process of creating a bay. And there's something like 29, 30 different software configuration events that occur in setting up a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and those are all the steps that you don't need to do if you're using Magnum. So these are the different API resources that we express in the Magnum API. We have a concept of a node. A node is one member of a, of a bay. And a node is always a Nova instance. Today, we can do Nova instances that are virtual machines. Over time, we'll be supporting any kind of Nova instance. So an ironic instance so that you can run your containers on bare metal. A, um, you know, alternate hypervisors if you're not using KVM. And then finally, a containers vert driver for Nova. And this sounds kind of like Inception, but you might want to run your bay in a container so that you get a more densely, uh, more densely packed arrangement of bays. So you would have, in that case, containers within containers. And this doesn't make any sense to people that are thinking about virtualization, because nested virtualization produces really bad performance outcomes. But nested containers don't. They have no performance penalty for running in a nested, in a nested arrangement. I'm using the word no uh, figuratively, because there is literally a tiny bit of overhead, but it is nothing like what you would experience with nested virtualization. And then we also have the ones that map to what are in the container orchestration engines. So pod, service, and container are all things that are all expressions that Kubernetes um, models, and we have direct mappings to those. We also have two different kinds of bays. So the, as, I, as I mentioned on Tuesday, the bay is the place where the container orchestration system goes. So you Start up, you have a Magnum API. As a user, you create a bay. As soon as you have a bay, you can start putting things in the bay. The things you put in there, if you're using the Kubernetes bay type, are pods. The things you put in there, if you're using the Docker Swarm bay type, are containers. So if you're using Docker Swarm as your container orchestration engine, then you have bays, nodes, and containers. And that's it. If you're using Kubernetes, you have bays, nodes, pods, containers, replication controllers, and services. The replication controller is this thing that determines how many of something there is running in your, uh, in your pod or across pods. A service is a way that you get TCP connections from clients to your, uh, to your running containers. Now, Magnum is different than other container software that has preceded it. And the number one way how it is different is it's multi-tenant. From the bottom to the top, if you create something in Magnum, only you're going to be able to see it. Your neighbors are not. And that's different than if you decide to run like a Kubernetes on your own. If you start a Kubernetes on your own and you create something in Kubernetes and somebody else uses your Kubernetes cluster, guess what? They see everything you made, which doesn't work in public cloud use cases. So we solve this. Second, when you combine the creation of containers with the creation of virtual machines, you're not dealing with sub-second uh, returns anymore. Now you're dealing with things that take seconds or minutes in order to complete. And you don't want a, an API client blocking for several minutes while you create a VM. Instead, we do this in an asynchronous fashion, so we have an asynchronous uh, API semantics. So when you ask for a bay, you're going to get a 201 created back instead of a 
very long delay. And then we're integrated with the OpenStack services. Everything that OpenStack does well, we just want to leverage. We don't want to reinvent the wheel anywhere. So identity, we're using Keystone. Orchestration, we're using Heat. For image storage, we're using Glance. For networking, we're using Neutron. So we're just leveraging everything that's already there. Now what you're going to see now is I'm going to bring, Steve is going to come over and we're going to show you a demo of how it works. And after that, you're going to get an opportunity to ask questions about what you see. Hi, folks. So let me maximize this so everybody can see it. I'll make it a little bigger, too. I don't want all that on there. Too big. Too big. Yeah, it's too big. See, on my computer, that's not too big. set to maximize. Oh, you don't. Here, let's just stretch it. Yeah, do that. OK. It's right size. That's good. OK, there you go. OK, so uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to source my Keystone credentials. Uh, so right now I'm running actually in a container deployment of OpenStack called Cola. Uh, we added Magnum to Cola kind of towards the end of our development cycle. Now, the only reason I do this is because DevStack changes, and I didn't want to check out the stable branches of DevStack and have something potentially break. I wanted to work with something that was stable. So what's cool about this is we're using RDO, which is very stable, and it's based upon the stable branches of uh, pretty much all of Kilo. So um, let me show you my OpenRC. Just a straight up OpenRC, just like uh, you would use in DevStack. So I source my credentials and do a whole bunch of things like uh, Neutron Netlist, so we can just see that uh, our system's working. And this system is running Cola mm. uh, for OpenStack, mm. and we're running Magnum as a, as a um, Cola container, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'll show you, uh, I wrote a couple of demos. Got one for Heat and one for Magnum. I'll go in the Magnum directory. And uh, what we use in Magnum, are our micro OSs. This is something Adrian didn't talk about. We use Fedora Atomic or Core OS. We could use other micro, or, uh, micro OSs like RHEL or Ubuntu. So there's some options there. But right now, I'm go going to demo Fedora 21. And uh, I'll show you our start scripts. Pretty straightforward. Um, let me actually get out here. So up here, we see, uh, I know this is a lot, of, a lot to take in, but it, uh, we just download the glance image, and then we get the, the Neutron NIC ID. Uh, and then what the script does is it deletes the old image and installs a new one, so it's pretty straightforward. And then we, um, we do a glance image update. Now the reason we do this is we register the distro uh, with glance, and that's how we determine which distro we're launching on, because we need to make decisions based on CoreOS or Atomic. So that's this, uh, this part right here, glance image update. And then uh, if you can press enter, Adrian. Thank you. So the first thing we do is we create a Bay model. Uh, now the reason I'm not typing this in is because I probably fat finger something and make an error. Um, the important parts here are uh, the fixed network. This is a private network that, that, that uh, the fixed network is a private network that Kubernetes runs on that's isolated from the rest of the system. This is for security reasons. And then we have to give an external network ID. The external network ID is so the Kubernetes cluster can con communicate with the outside world. These are the mo most important things. We give some flavor information, and we specify a container uh, orchestration engineer, Kubernetes. And then the last thing we do is a Magnum bake rate. Uh, we specify the name we want. We give it a Bay model uh, name. This is a Bay model up here, this line. So we named a test Bay model. We're going to actually create the Bay based upon the Bay model. A Bay model is like a flavor in Nova. So it's a similar idea. And then we give it a no count. So that's a script, uh, pretty straightforward. Just so I don't fat finger it, I'm not going to type it all in. I'll just run it. Uh, first, let me show you there's no Bays running. Oh. I have to do this, let's, let's do that, unfortunately.
And the reason I have to do this as sudo is because my Python client is installed with pip e in my home directory and I'm on somebody else's login. Uh, so you don't have to run with sudo. That's just uh, my environmental thing here. So there, you can see there's no bay list. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and run the script, the start script there. And we see it's uh, printing out a little bit of information, downloads a glance image, uh, very straightforward. Now it's downloading it into glance. So we just have it on the hard disk. It's loading in the glance. Yeah. This is a pseudo pip thing. So when you started, um, you created the Bay model. The Bay model is essentially a template. So when you create a bay, it inherits all the attributes that are in the bay model. So that you don't have to specify them all as a train of very, very long arguments to uh, the bay create command. So bay create typically has two or three um, arguments to it rather than um, you know 15, which is what you might need if you were creating a bay uh, from scratch. And the bay create is the thing that the tenant actually does. Mm. The bay models may actually be put in there by the service provider in advance by the cloud operator in advance. Um, or you can have the, your, your users create their own. But the idea is the thing that the user creates is the bay. Right, thanks. Based, based on the bay model. Okay, I'll go ahead and start it up again. Uh, the script can be just repeated. And uh, I'm actually logged in as myself now, so I can actually access my own Magnum client that's uh, installed in my home directory. Uh, so we're, again, we're gonna download the glance image. Very straightforward. And this is the image that's going to run on the hosts inside the bay. Mm. The, the nodes, the what we call nodes. And the so. nodes, right. right. Now we created a bay. Now one of the cool things about uh, what Adrian talked about is we use heat. Uh, so we can just kind of look at uh, the stack list. And we see that test bay there. That's actually the one we created. Uh, it just picks up the name. And we can do something like resource. Show and Is an R there. Uh, what's that? Oh, resource. Yeah. Resource. Yeah. Here we go. I type all the time. Type fast with lots of mistakes. That's my motto. So what this shows. Oh, I gotta get the resource list. That's actually, what I wanted. Okay, what, what this shows is all the different events happening inside of Heat. Uh, Adrian talked about the, the cloud event, the, uh, the cloud init events. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens here. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about this. Um, what we can see, though, is it's going to launch some Nova uh, instances, and there's actually already some running. Um, not, not ideal. I'm going to delete those. So it's still creating. Um, my machine is Xeon. I've got SSD, so it's pretty fast. Uh, we're creating one master node and two minion nodes, and we're also deleting my old, uh, my old stake uh, heat, uh, heat stack there. And the reason why this isn't happening instantaneously is because we are using um, VMs as the bay nodes. Mm -hmm. So if we were using containers as the bay nodes or um, just adopting bare metal machines as bay nodes, bay creations could be instantaneously um, returned. Right, and uh, one of the interesting things <coughs> is we have really good integration with Neutron, so I can do something like a Neutron port list. And we see these are all the ports assigned to the bay. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about what the different IPs mean, but if I can show a Nova list. Maybe Nova we'll, list. Yes, if I can yes. spell it right. Okay. That's with lots of mistakes. There we go. Oops. <laughs> Yay. Uh, success. Okay, we see the, uh, the minions are active. Actually, I created this demo with just one minion. And um, there's actually a bug in Nova. It's un very unfortunate. But for example, you see on this last line, you don't see the IP addresses. This is a bug in both Juno and uh, Kilo of Nova. It's not a cola problem. This is a. In the networks? Yeah, it's box. the instant, yeah, the network's box. That may be a client bug, actually. No, it's an instance info cache in Nova. I've debugged it quite a bit. Uh, something's definitely broken there. But uh, what we can see here is we can see the minions IP, the floating IP is the last one there, so I'm going to log into that. And 
everybody gets a minion name login. No? It hasn't finished setting up yet. Too. Now, what, what does base status show us? Yeah, I'll show. Magnum, Magnum Bay list. list yeah. Oops. That's about right. You know, the problem with OpenStack is you have to type so much. Create complete. Okay, create okay. complete. Now, now I'll give it a try. No. Show. Okay, so that gives us our node address. can show is we can show Redis. So I've got a Redis script, which is very straightforward. Um, what, what the Redis script does is here is we create a pod. Um, now, Adrian talked about the pod option. So Magnum just uses pod create. We give it a manifest. We saw that the bay is created complete. I'm not quite sure why the SSH key isn't registered. It doesn't really matter. Uh, then we do a service create. Uh, and then we do an RC create. RC is a replication controller that creates pods across the system uh, in replication and then keeps those uh, running. So if you want to pull the trigger on that, Adrian, and run it. Dot forward there. there go. Now, th we communicate with Magnum um, to do all this work. We had a session Monday, which I think was very interesting, where we talked about having native tools communicate with Magnum. Uh, I think we're going to tackle that work pretty early in the cycle. But we can see, for example, we can see Magnum pod list. And this puts out a whole bunch of information. Uh, now, I'm not actually going to demo Redis, because I haven't used Redis in a lot of detail. This does show that the pods work, and Kubernetes is launching the pods, and Kubernetes is set up in the environment. Mm -hmm. So you wanted to show a Bay update. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and show that? So a bay update, the way a bay update works is we can update the node count or we can scale up. And the scale up allows us to add minions to the system uh, while the system is running. Um, now, somebody in the community has submitted a, an auto-scaling uh, patch so we can scale up and down. Uh, it's going to take a little while to sort out, but definitely scale up works really nicely. See Adrian's fat fingering. I did. No, you got that. I was making a bad joke, I guess. There we go. Node and count. Okay, we, I incremented node count from one to two. So we should see now if we do our bay list again. You see the status of the bay is going to go to update in progress, and this is mirroring what's happening in the. Um, this is not actually a state that's inside of Magnum. This is a state that's inside of heat, mm. because we're, this is actually happening in a heat orchestration. And you can show that in just heat list, if, or Nova list, if you want. You can show the new VM running, or being created, one of the two. Yeah, you see this one right here? It's in build state. So this menu will come up. It will <coughs> register with our overlay network flannel. It registers with the Minion software inside of Kubernetes. Cool thing is we talked a lot about Kubernetes today, but we also support Swarm. We just don't have enough time to demo Swarm. We talked about CoreOS. We don't have enough time to demo CoreOS, so we have to pick what we're going to demo. I know why you couldn't log in. Why is that? Because you created it under Danian's account. Oh, yeah, that's right. And it used his key. Yeah. And now you're in your account, and okay. you don't have the key. Cool. Uh, let me switch over then. <laughs> I did want to show something, actually. Thank you for thinking through that. So I think it's a good time to take input from our audience. Yeah, that's good. What would you like guys like to know about? Um, 
There is. Um, when you create a bay, you get an attribute called node address. And that's the address of the kube master. So you can actually use kubectl and point the uh, Kubernetes master environment variable at that address and use kubectl directly with. Um, Um, it would be, it would be uh, right now, you would just make a direct connection to the IP, and it's unprotected, but, but we're, we have an open blueprint for using a TLS key pair in order to do that authorization. This is why we recommend you don't deploy Magnum yet, because there's no TLS endpoint security. We need to tackle that. I wanted to show real quick. But if you're using it on a network that is, if private. it's a private cloud scenario private. and you're using it on a network that's not on a public network, yeah. this may be fine. But, Right, exactly. So I want to show real quick, I am logged into the menu now, thanks that Adrian debugged uh, my key problem. Yep. I was logged in with a different person's credentials. Uh, I did want to show, so we can run like kube control inside the soft, inside the minion. So I can do a, like a minion get. Yeah, so your know. choice is that you can run the like, minion. from the client that you use to create the, the bay, you can, um, you can use kubectl from there. Or what, what he's showing you now is he's in the kube master and he's running kubectl from that which is going to connect to a local address, right? Um, we or did a bay update, right. now we have two bays listed in Kubernetes in the ready state. So that yeah. actually works, bay update works. And uh, I can uh, do something like get pause. See, people want to use kube control, uh, not necessarily Magnum, but we need to have Magnum for heat integration for other projects, the Magnum client. So um, what this shows here, this is just a Kubernetes thing of downloading the Redis software. Um, and we see that uh, everything should be in the, uh, it's in the running state, so that means it's running uh, inside of Kubernetes. You had a question? Uh, yes, so the patch that you mentioned for auto scaling, yes. is it going to be become worse than uh, the, the problem with scaling down is if you delete uh, a node, then what do you do with the information on the node? You may lose persistent data. So I'm not real keen on the scale down. I'd love to scale up. I suggested to the person that authored the patch to just make it scale up. And, uh, you know, I think to scale down, we need support from Kubernetes. Uh, also, if I could encourage people, if they have questions, to queue up at the microphone so uh, the, the questions can be recorded. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Yeah. Is, uh, is there going to be like a policy or a rule-based approach to scale up? Uh, yeah, definitely. Is there a scaling policy yeah. feature coming? That was the question. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So Kubernetes doesn't yet Support have a way to scale down. down. Yeah. Um, as soon as it does, we can we can uh, use that capability. Question? Uh, I would have a question about the CLI. Uh, a lot of the OpenStack projects are going to the OpenStack CLI, the common tools. How do you see it happening with Magnum? And if not, will Magnum <coughs> support Keystone V3 APIs to Authenticate. I'll, I'll take that one. Sure, okay. So um, there is an open blueprint for integrating with OSC, and that work, I believe, is happening already. I think Ronald Bradford was, was working on that, and there's another stacker who, who volunteered to do that work. So that should be done very soon. It's a very, it's a very trivial integration because we already have Python Magnum client. So putting it in OSC is less than a day's work. Okay. More questions? Yes. Cool. Would you mind queuing at the mic just so folks can hear? And because it's recorded and whatnot. Could you guys talk a little about, bit about the plans for network integration and uh, like what's going to happen with Flannel, what's on the roadmap for Docker and some of the other, uh, basically some of the other issues and, uh, and improvements that can be expected in the networking layer with respect to containers. Great question. So um, Docker 1.6 is integrating with lib network which has its own implementation for connecting containers to other containers. Um, and it's been suggested on the mailing list, even this morning I was reading a, a, a note there that maybe we should just use that. Uh, the drawback of taking that approach is that it's not generic across any container 
format. It's specific to Docker. Um, not that another container system couldn't leverage lib network, um, but none have yet. So we had two design sessions yesterday about this topic, and we got to a point of clarity that for now, using something like Flannel as an overlay um, is functional. It's just not as, um, not as performant as if you just had one layer of SDN in there rather than an encapsulation layer plus um, an SDN and then on the physical. So um, we've talked about ways to plug in to tools like Flannel and tools like Lib Network um, neutron implementations so that instead of having VXLAN on top of a neutron network, you would just have a neutron network underneath it. So that's our current, our current thinking. Um, so that we're handling in this kind of a generic way that's not specific to a, a particular container type. Um, and it would be the upstream projects where we would make those contributions that would plug into OpenStack. So that's the current plan. Yeah, we definitely <clears throat> want to get rid of the memory copies because those are expensive. Uh, and I, I think the way to do that is integration with Flannel more tightly with Neutron. Yep. I was curious if there's any uh, thoughts on how persis persistent data volumes might be handled, um, any integration with Cinder, or is there some better way to handle persistent data volumes that I may want to attach and detach between containers? I'll go ahead and take this one. Okay. So uh, we have Cinder support already, so we do have persistent volumes. Now, if the VMs were to die for some reason and they failed, you would lose that information because right now in Magnum, there's no way to connect that that a new VM, uh, if you were to create a new bay, or sorry, a new node for a bay because one failed, there's no way to attach that cinder volume back to the VM. We talked a lot about that in the design session, how to handle that. Uh, somebody mentioned HA restarter from heat, but that's been deprecated, so we're not gonna use deprecated functionality. Uh, so we, I would say it's an unsolved problem in Magnum, uh, but it's something we wanna solve. Now we did talk a lot about persistent state. We talked about using Manila in the design sessions for uh, storing information between different containers. Not sure if we'll do that. Uh, we're definitely going to use Cinder as a hard dependency for our persistent storage. Uh, one problem we have with Cinder is we can't have mo mo multiple nodes mount a volume, which is what it, how it should behave, right? That's correct. That's why we talked about uh, Manila, for example. Um, one issue with Kubernetes is they haven't quite finished the volume support for OpenStack, so there needs to be some work there. And uh, I think that gets to the guts of your question as to how do we support that, and the answer is we really need to wait for Kubernetes upstream to do their job. And the, they're doing a great job, fantastic upstream. Uh, they're just really overloaded. Thanks. And we are well coordinated with that project. Yeah. So there's. There's continuing communication, and we're confident that it's going to come out well. Uh, yesterday in the, the talk on OVN, uh, the OVM developers were mentioning that containers were kind of designed in as first-class uh, citizen from the beginning. Does, that, uh, does the OVN work impact any of the things that are going on in Magnum, or is it just unrelated? It is uh, one of the subjects of discussion from yesterday's design session. Um, my understanding is OVN is what allows us to have multiple mappings per uh, per guest, which is what would allow containers to work. Um, we didn't get too deep into the implementation details because we were trying to uh, focus in on what's our guiding philosophy for where these things belong. That's where we spent most of our time. Um, but I believe that our first implementations probably will leverage the OVN, at least for the reference implementation. And then as we get, um, you know, for more and more different neutron driver types, additional additional implementations. Yeah, I would add to that one thing we want to make sure we don't do in Magnum is pick something that uh, only one type of networking infrastructure supports. So uh, most people want either OVS or Linux bridge, so we want both. And OVN doesn't offer that today, but I think it could. I talked with, uh, with the folks in the Neutron community at the core approver party last night, and they were pretty keen on the idea. So I think uh, it definitely happened. So um, attending a lot of these container sessions uh, in the past few days, uh, seems like OpenStack talks generically about containers, but there's um, my observation that close affinity towards Kubernetes than Docker. 
So is that an accurate observation? At the moment, that happens to be the case. Okay. And is there a um, reason why that things is? Are, things are moving rather quickly. If you would have asked me that same question three months ago, it would have had a different answer. Um, okay. And three months from now, who knows? But we do know that you know, CoreOS has expressed an interest in putting uh, rocket support into the Kubernetes Bay type, so that we expect that to come. Um, you're going to see support for a Mesos Bay type as well. If the interest that we saw expressed yesterday in the design track uh, ends up turning into code. So I think the, the point here is that when you make a choice as a service provider on what your container strategy is going to be, there is risk in picking a winner right now mm -hmm. because things are moving so quickly. And if you say, look, I understand OpenStack is going to be part of my equation and I'm choosing Magnum and for now I'm going to use you know, you select which bay type you want today. If you decide later you want to start using different bay types, that's fine. And you're going to be able to use them side by side. I showed you in the demo in the keynote on Tuesday that I had a swarm bay sitting side by side with the Kubernetes bay. Mm -hmm. So you'll have an actual uh, migration strategy for your users. Okay. So, you know, uh, Kubernetes happens to be the thing now. It may end up prevailing. Um, who knows? Things might change, and we want you to have you know, a pluggability story so that you can be able to um, put in whatever your users really want when the time comes. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay. Any more questions from the audience? We're almost at time. Yeah, we are. Two minutes. Good timing. Right. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you.